Thank you, Taylor. Good afternoon, everybody. Um, and following up on the previous talk on soybean, we'll be talking about corn and insect management. Um, actually, now that I realize it, this not, not after I could start this slide says 2021, um, but this means actually 2022 from updates on last season and um, what we're gonna see this season and even beyond um, and some of the insect problems that we'll see. Um, so for an overview of the talk today, um, we'll talk a little bit more about Asiatic garden beetle, which has been a consistent pest uh, in corn, especially in the northwest corner of the state. Um, we see it in soybean every once in a while, um, actually very, very, very rarely, but it is a problem in corn um, and a consistent problem. We'll talk a little bit more about some of the research we've been doing uh, on that. We'll talk about caterpillars and ears. We have seen more and more uh, damage from Lepidopteran from caterpillars in ears. Um, and this is from species that we typically don't even uh, see um, damage from. But it is something that we'll have to be um, mindful of in the future. Um, there's probably many reasons why we see a, an increase in caterpillars. Um, it has to do with some changing weather climates, um, changing weather patterns, wind patterns, and also uh, updates on BT uh, resistance. Um, and this not only goes for caterpillars, but this also goes for rootworms as well. Um, we'll talk more about this in detail. The good news is for Ohio is that we don't have as many um, BT resistance problems as other states do, um, and that's good. Um, but we'd like to keep that as long as possible. So we'll talk about some strategies we can do to make sure that these products are and remain um, uh, uh, beneficial and effective uh, for Ohio. So first, a brief update on Asiatic garden beetle. Uh, this is a invasive white grub species that was first found uh, in New Jersey. And this was uh, a long time ago, um, early 1900s, I think, and 1921, actually. And now it's found in, in, in many parts of the US. Um, this is a very common uh, grub species in these areas. Um, it's very similar to other grubs um, in size, but it has a very different behavior um, than many of our, our white grubs. And when I say white grubs, these are rose chafers, these are Japanese beetle grubs. A lot of these tend to be even turf grass pests. I mean, you see them, you're digging up the grass, your lawn, or even cutting grass, and you'll find some of these guys. And they're really not nice to look at, um, kind of really ugly, one of our ugliest insects that we have. Um, and so when we see white grubs, this is what we normally refer to. Um, and these are the larval stages of some of the large beetle species that we have. Again, um, June bugs, Japanese beetles, those type of things. The Asiatic garden beetle is somewhat different. And here's the Asiatic, or Asiatic garden beetle grub right here. It tends to be smaller in shape. Um, it tends to be kind of more of a C-shaped, whereas the most of the other white grub species tend to be more comma-shaped. Um, there are some patterns in the on the hair uh, towards the end. Um, of the grubs, but really, if the grubs are small um, and they have a C shape, um, and one of the, the main characteristics to differentiate Asiatic garden beetle from other grub species is this white kind of bubble here on the uh, near the mouth. And if we zoom here, um, this is right near the the mandibles of the garden beetle, um, and you can see it's kind of uh, almost like a, like a like a swollen white bubble here, and that's a really good characteristic. Another characteristic that you will see with the Asiatic garden beetle is if you dig them up from the soil, they're re they're very um, active. They're really sensitive to light, so they become active almost immediately, um, and on occasion they will bite. And so just be careful if you're handling these. If you see dig one up, it starts moving around, drop that thing immediately, or they can bite because they're quite uh, 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 very good diggers. So um, we have seen a lot of damage between 2006 and 2012. Um, this is when the damage really started to increase and now we've seen recurring damage, um, mainly in these areas within sort of the tri-state area, Michigan, Indiana, uh, and Ohio. Um, and we've seen um, uh, Michigan State and Purdue and, and us, we've reported on some of the issues we've seen with Asiatic Garden Beetle. Uh, one of the things that's kind of consistent with this area is that there's a lot of sandy soils up here, and we think there's a very strong association between the presence 
and the damage of Asiatic garden beetle and uh, sandy soils. Uh, so here's some pictures um, from um, uh, Amy Roddenbush, who, is, uh, who works with Kelly Tillman, uh, who you heard from earlier today. Um, and this is up in that area in Northwestern Ohio. I think this picture was most likely from Fulton County. And right away, you can see the soil, soil here is, is very sandy, and this is typical of some, most of the uh, soils that are in the sort of heavy uh, infestation zone of it. Um, and also what you see is that you can really see the soil here because the corn just looks really, really stunted and looks really, really weak. Um, and this is typical of AGB infestations, very stunted corn. You can kind of even see purpling, which we'll see a little bit in a bit. And you can see almost a, um, a difference in distribution. And this kind of area looks a little bit uh, thicker, but you notice here that the soil is a little bit darker. And so this might be a little dark, kind of different soil type, but where we have the presence of a lot of sandy soils here, even back here, you can see lighter soils. Um, we see a lot of damage um, and, and impact from AGBs. Here's some other images from Southwest, Southwest Michigan. Uh, you can see here a little farther advanced um, cornfield, but there's a lot of skips in the, in the row here. It's very uneven in appearance and a lot of sort of just empty places in the row. Um, and here you see again, Northern Indiana where there are parts of the field, again, typically sandy soil that are just really wiped out from Asiatic garden beetle. Um, and in, Part of the, the, the stunting of growth and the, and, the, and the damage of the plant and killing the plant comes from their feeding. They tend to be right near the soil line and feeding right along here near the emerging roots. Um, and sometimes this results in the purpling corn, which you saw maybe a little bit in the earlier photographs, but it's really evident here where there's a purpling. I think it has... A, has probably something to do with um, a loss of nutrients and micronutrients because of the damage here. But you can see this Asiatic garden beetle um, just chewing away right here at the roots. And this can be really damaging, especially to corn in a time period, early season, that's really critical for corn to get that good, strong root mass to get those nutrients to put a lot of the growth on. Um, if this video sh shows, this is going to show some um, um, uh, an analysis that, that I was doing up with uh, Eric Rieker in Fulton County many years ago, um, trying to dig um, Asiatic garden beetle up. And then you can see here um, that this plant here is a little stunted um, and you can see purpling. And that kind of gave us the sign that there could be some Asiatic garden beetle damage um, and infestation here. And so there's one AGB. Here's the plant that I'm digging up right here. You can see it's very small and really evident in purpling. Um, and so that this is the second AGB. Uh, again, notice the type of soil, soil here, uh, very fine, uh, a lot of sand in here. And this is just a very um, characteristic of where we see the highest risk for AGBs. Um, uh, so this is the fourth one now. Again, you can see they're starting to move around here. We've dug them up, they're getting exposed to the warm sun um, and they're starting to move around. Um, Here's the damage. You can see very, very weak roots on this plant that's stunt stunting the growth. And what are we up to? Five here. Um, and I think there's probably one, two, three, four, five. And I think there's a sixth one here. Yep, there he is. So just this plant alone had six AGBs within, you know, very close proximity to it feeding. Um, and under heavy infestation, that could be very, very serious, as you can, as you can tell. Um, and, and this is, uh, in, in really heavy infestations, this is typical to see this many AGBs. The life stage um, is, is, you know, not very complex. Um, right now, they are overwintering in the soil, really deep in the soil, um, as really advanced um, uh, uh, instars. Um, and then as they get closer to April and May, they move up to the soil. Um, and then that's when they really start to do a lot of their feeding as second and third instars um, at this stage here. Now, the issue is that this is typically when we start to plant corn at the same time. So as corn is growing, especially if it's early planted corn and the roots start to form, that's the exact time that these guys kind of wake up and start feeding on corn. We have seen the most damage to early planted corn. Um, typically, and it's all weather dependent as well, but corn planted in the third, fourth week of May tends to evade a lot of the damage from EGBs. But then, I mean, there's issues with planting corn that late too. 
too. So it's kind of a, a, a difficult situation on, on planting date and trying to manage the emergence with AGB. Towards uh, early June, uh, or try mid uh, late June and, and early July, we see a lot of pupation, and then we see um, and then we see adult emergence here as well. Once the adults emerge, they may lay eggs. The eggs hatch um, in the first instars or so. There's some damage here in August and September, but not to our field crops. I mean, by this time, any kind of damage to the roots is going to be uh, uh, not harmful to the, to the plant. And then the overwintering continues. This is sometimes where we see a lot of uh, potential damage to, to, to turf as well. But what we're looking for with corn is this April, May time period where they're just starting to wake up and the corn's just starting to grow. Um, and then we can see a lot of feeding damage from that. Here's an image um, from uh, Adrian Pekarczyk, who was a grad student of Kelly Timmons, doing a lot of good research on um, Asiatic garden beetle. And so the, here's a field here, you can see the outline. And what we have here is the soil maps. And what you can see is, right, it's a very close uh, pro uh, proximity and, and relationship between sandy soil uh, and really high incidence of Asiatic garden beetle. And all of this damage here is all Asiatic garden beetle. Um, and it really limits, um, um, it can, and, and serious infestations can cause uh, quite extensive damage. So how do we manage it? What to look for? Again, look for stunted plants. So um, here you can see corn that was, the, the, the in certain areas look really, really good. And then here's corn that's just really struggling to get some good growth on. And again, some of the purpling uh, that we see. Uh, the plant stand, look for stand up to up to almost 40%, you know, in this image here, where you're looking for almost 100% stand loss in, 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 in these areas. There's also um, a financial loss to be planting. If you planted early and the grubs are feeding, um, there could be an opportunity to plant again if you're in late May. But again, there's there's a financial loss from replanting that, uh, and also the yield loss associated, uh, the potential yield loss associated with planting later. Um, and then again, the, like I said, the indirect yield loss from from late replant and the timing with that. So how do we manage these guys? Well. We know what doesn't work or what's likely not to work. And the current insecticidal seed treatments um, at any rate, even the high rate, tend not to do that good of a job um, with Asiatic garden beetle. Potentially with low pressure, you, there might be some evidence where you can get some protection from seed treatments. But in cases where in that video where we're having um, you know, six grubs uh, uh, per plant, I mean, it's really hard for seed treatments to um, uh, it's really hard for seed treatments to uh, to really protect against that. Um, so most inferral products at labeled rates tend to have some issues with control of Asiatic garden beetle. We've seen a lot of movement in these soils, um, and they kind of maybe enter the zone where those nectarides are at, and then they go, can go back in the rows. We have found them between the rows when they're not feeding, and they move very, very quickly. So sometimes that might be very difficult to really get that effective dose and the killing dose on grubs. Um, tillage in these areas, we only see minor suppression, and I think that's because when they overwinter, um, they can be really, really deep. And the tillage right now might not be able to really impact them um, in terms of mortality because they're, they're, they can dig really far, uh, both vertically up and down and across the rows. We've heard of some farmers trying to do a trick where they're spraying soybean at R3, and the rationale because is, is um, at this stage, so here's a picture of adults that also burrow near mare's tail, um, especially if you have weedy fields, the adults tend to be out in that mid-July stage. Um, if you spray the adults, there could be a chance that you kill females before egg laying is going on. Um, we don't know. We uh, have um, issues of reproducibility with trying to get this data set. Um, it's very hard because populations are not that predictable. Yes, you can see some garden beetles in soybean, but it's not, we don't see a really strong association between soybean, you know, corn after soybean. Um, sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. So there could be chances for wasting spraying and soybean. Um, and there's some issues with spraying soybean 
with insecticides at R3 when there are no insects and thinking about flare-ups of other other issues. So um, we're, we haven't seen, we we're still working on getting a lot of data to see if this is actually an effective management uh, technique. But at this point, we don't recommend doing this because of all the other issues associated with the unpredictability of spraying soybean at R3, specifically for Asiatic garden beetle control. We know some products that do work. So chlorethafox is, is very effective based on some of the lab studies that, that Kelly Tillman's lab is doing. Um, this can be found in, in the product called uh, Index, which alpha contains bifenthrin, and Smart Choice, which is the granules. And so we've seen some good um, work with, um, with this chemical, um, and we're hoping to maybe continue this work kind of in the field to see if this can actually um, benefit some of the AGB management. And so now let's switch gears a little bit and talk about some of the problems we've seen with caterpillars in corns uh, and in corn. And this is really um, most evident of three different caterpillar species that we see in Ohio um, and, and a resulting of increasing ear feeding by caterpillars. It seems like we're getting more and more calls every year on the presence of a lot of ear feeding. You know, we do see a lot of corn pathogens on in corn, which some of them may be related to some of the, of the feeding behavior that these caterpillars do as well. Um, and sometimes when we see this, the pathogens, um, the caterpillars are long gone too. So sometimes we don't see that association, but there is an association with the feeding damage and, and opening corn up to the elements that then facilitates fungal infection. One of the main ones we've seen is Western bean cutworm. And that's this one here. Uh, we see European corn borer, which, you know, for, for many years up until mid, the mid-1990s, European corn borer was our most important pest of corn. Um, and then in the mid-90s, we had BT and the GMO corn, BT corn to, to protect, protect against that. We also have seen repeated evidence of corn earworm here, which is kind of a relatively new pest for Ohio um, and something that we'll need to watch out for. So these are the three main ones that, that, that we need to be worried about in Ohio. Western bean cutworm was first found in 2007 or 2006, 2007 in, in Ohio, um, but it really wasn't a significant pest until 2013, 2014, we really saw some heavy damage from it. Um, and, and this has one generation per year, and we see uh, moths flying around, you know, starting end of June, but July seems to be the heavy month of moth flying um, and overposition in cornfields. Um, and, 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 and mid-July is, is where it really is, is high risk, especially if we have late planted corn um, that hasn't tasseled by peak flight, then that really increases the risk of, of Western bean cutworm damage. The adults are, are um, um, uh, have some good characteristics that we can use to identify them. One of them is this white um, coloring, this white stripe on the leading edge of the forewing. Another one is this the circle here. And then here we have this kind of boomerang shape or, or comma shape here on the four ring. So these three characteristics are really good to identify the adults of, of Western bean cutworm. Eggs are laid from about July until August. Um, uh, they're usually laid in clumps of 25 to 100. And so this is a typical size of a Western bean cutworm egg mast. And they usually hatch within, which within five to seven days. A lot of that depends on temperature. Warmer temperatures at the time of, of overposition egg laying, um, you'll see a quicker egg hatch. And at cooler temperatures, you'll see a, a, a longer uh, time to egg hatch. They start out at this white color. So if you see these white egg masses, that means they're usually freshly laid. As they kind of mature, they turn kind of a tan pink color. And then they turn this really interesting purple color. And if you see this purple color, this usually means that egg hatch occurs within 24 hours. Um, and this is, this is key because for control, if you're looking at an arrow, uh, an application, foliar application of insecticides, you want to time it correctly when egg hatch is occurring, but before those larvae enter the ear. Because in the egg stage, they're really not uh, going to be able to control them because uh, they're protected from insecticides. And once they enter the ear, control is very, very difficult. So while a lot of our insecticides are very effective against western bean cutworm larvae, the timing is what's so difficult when controlling that because you have to get them in between that time that they're really young, they're out of the eggs, and 
they're feeding on pollen on, on the on the on the leaves, maybe even a little bit of the silk. But once they enter that corn ear, it's going to be really really hard to to control. Um, like I said, the later stages move to the ear and start to feed. The real key identifier for Western bean cutworm larvae are these two stripes right behind the head. They're really dark brown, almost a black color here um, behind the head and with a kind of a white line right be, be here. Typical tan capsule. The body is really kind of nondescript. Sometimes you can see some coloration um, and kind of a dark stripe on either side with kind of a pink or gray color on the top. They're usually not very colorful, but the um, the tan had light brown head with the dark brown stripes are the two characteristics that really can identify um, Western bean cutworm. Here's some other examples here. Um, here, a light, light colored head and dark brown, um, a broad, you know, the, the wide stripes here. And again, kind of like the, the very non distrib coloration. Oftentimes, you'll see <clears throat> more than one larvae per ear with Western bean cutworm. That's not the case with all uh, caterpillar species, um, but in most cases, you can see more than one larvae uh, feeding on, on, on ears for Western bean cutworm. Here they can chew on the silk and then enter the silk that way, or you can see here they can go down and chew through the, the husk and, and, and feed on the corn that way. Uh, when more than one adults are caught in a night, and we'll talk about trapping in a bit, that's when our recommendations are to scout. And you really want to focus on the presence of these egg masses and focus on pre tassel corn. Here you have an egg mass that's white, freshly laid, probably within five days, this will turn purple and start to hatch. The eggs are laid on the uppermost two leaves, really close um, to the top of the plant, to the tassel. And they really prefer the leaves that are still at that um, uh, a vertical orientation. Once they get really horizontal, that's not a really good site for egg laying. Uh, so we have thresholds for Western Maine cutworm. Uh, we recommend to inspect 10 plants in, in 10 different locations. And make sure you look across the rows too, not just down the rows, because we do see evidence of them moving a lot in the field. Um, Pre-tassel corn is preferred by Western bean cutworm females to oviposit in, so we recommend doing pre-tassel corn first. And our threshold is 5 to 8 percent, and typically even in, in, in our areas, because we tend to see somewhat decent survival, you want to look at 5 percent of, of plants having an egg mass. That's when treatment is probably necessary. And again, start the spray after the egg hatch, but before the larvae enter the ear. The window can be very short on this, especially in warm temperatures, perhaps maybe be even just three or four days before the larvae start to really grow and, 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 and enter that ear. That's why really good egg scouting and watching for that purpling, purpling color are going to be your good uh, um, tactics to manage against Western bean cutworm. Um, just a little bit, we don't have the 2022 trapping data yet right now, but the good news is that, you know, when 2014, 2016 seemed to be high areas um, of Western Maine cutworm, since then we haven't seen a lot of damage from, from this past. Our, our consistently high areas of, of adult trapping, and I should say this is adult trapping, not for the presence of larvae or the presence of damage, tend to be in this Northwest Ohio corner here. And then we get a lot of Northeast Ohio moths um, but I think a lot of these are kind of lake effect moths um, coming in across from Canada and Michigan and coming across Lake Erie and just depositing here in the first site of land, which tends to be these areas. But really, the, the um, US 30 corridor, if you're north of US 30, tends to be where we see a lot of adults. And if we see damage, it's tend to going to be in, in this area. So uh, switching to corn earworm, this is not necessarily a, a uh, frequently discovered pests, especially in field corn. It does, uh, it is probably one of the most important pests in, in sweet corn, but occasionally we can find it in field corn. They fly, the moths, adults um, fly in July and September. And we've seen heavier populations in the last few years. And in fact, in 2019, there was some uh, a field that was heavily infested uh, uh, near Worcester in Wayne County that 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 Kelly and I visited, and we we were able to collect a lot of a lot of larvae from 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 that field. Um, and like I said, it's an emerging issue in field corn. This is not a resident pest in Ohio. This is a pest that migrates from the southern U.S. It does not overwinter here, and so when the southern U.S. has high populations or there's a wind, wind, strong wind pattern that brings the moths up to Ohio. We've also seen some association with a lot of 
hurricane remnants that maybe come through the Gulf, and we've all seen the wind damage, but along with the winds, we can bring also evidence of, of Lepidopteran and moths too that come up and, and bring up corny worm. In field corn, um, it's more difficult to, to find these. Um, silking is a critical time because here's the adult uh, moth and they like to lay the eggs in the silk. And these are very, very difficult to find um, and, and much harder than Western Bean Cotworm. And so really trapping for moth activity is gonna be the, the best bet. For European corn borer, uh, this, there's two generations of this pest per year. It's an earlier foliar feeder, so you can see some damage at, uh, on, 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 and they look like almost like um, um, uh, minor random holes on, on, on the leaves early in the season, in the early V stages, or probably between V4 and, and V7. Um, and, and later in the season, it becomes an ear feeder that second generation, the eggs are laid on the leaves, and then it can enter and, and feed on the corn and even burrow within there. Um, so here we have a corn burrow larvae here. Um, these are relatively easy to spot. One of the characteristics of European corn borers is they have dark black heads um, and not much striping on the body, but they have these kind of little dots on the body. And that's a really good um, um, way to, to, to identify European corn borer um, pests. The timing is, is kind of interesting, but difficult because if you have infestations of one, sometimes you might need um, repeated sprays if you get continual infestations because the timing is, is related, but not all the same. So with European corn borer, they're overwintering as larvae right now in the fields. Um, and then they'll pupate in May. And then in, in May, June, we see the emergence of moths and then the eggs are laid and the larvae feeds kind of like mid-June or so, all weather dependent. And that's where we can see some of the foliar damage. Um, larvae pupate within the stalk, and then moths re-emerge again in August or so, in a late July, August, and we see another presence of eggs. And this is where we can see some feeding damage of on the ears. Um, and this usually occurs um, in mid to late August, and we see some feeding on that. This is different from Western Bean Cutworm, which tends to be a lot earlier in the season. So Western Bean Cutworm um, spend um, uh, the winter as larvae, then they pupate in May and June. The moths emerge mid to late June. And again, the month of July is when we see a lot of eggs. And then, you know, the third week of uh, July, end of July, we see the larval infestation. Um, and the larvae persist here, but the heaviest damage that we can see from Western Bean Cutworm is usually um, uh, late July. And then corn airworm, we tend to get the moths, sometimes in July, August or so, eggs and then larvae. And again, these do not overwinter here. So starting in mid-July, we can see evidence of Western Mean cutworm. And then on certain years, we see evidence of corn borers and then uh, depends on corn earworm. So the damage timing is a little bit different going from um, Western Mean cutworm. Corn earworm is a little bit harder predi to predict because it is dependent on weather and on migration and then European corn borer. Caterpillar ID for the eggs, we've gone through Western Mean cutworm, uh, gone through corn earworm again. Uh, and for European corn borer, they uh, are laid again on the upper leaf surface. They tend to start out kind of white. They almost look like fish scales. Um, and then they're smaller, typically smaller than Western Bean Cutworm egg masses. And then when they're close to emerging, you can they turn a little bit dark. And this is kind of like the head capsules of the really, really tiny larvae. Um, larvae, uh, corn earworm. We didn't talk about corn earworm. They tend to have lighter color heads and they're really, they have lots of stripes and they come in very, very different colors. Um, sometimes entomologists refer to corn earworm as the Skittles because they all, they come in all colors of the rainbow. Um, uh, I've really seen green and black ones. I have never seen a pink one. That might be something to do with a different host, but you will find different colors of corn earworm on corn. Again, Western Bean cutworm, light colored head, and then these dark stripes, uh, wide stripes behind behind the head, and then corn border, dark head, and really kind of just dots on the body. The best way to look for um, caterpillars is to start earlier and watch for the emergence of moths. I mean, we use pheromone traps to do that. There's uh, most are very inexpensive, and, and it really gives you good information to tell you when moths are active. And this gives you the uh, timing and when to get in your fields and start to scout for eggs and larvae. We use two types of traps: one, these bucket traps, and and two of these these kind of heliothis traps. These are good for corn borer and corn earworm, but these are really good for Western bean cutworm. And again, they're relatively cheap and they can be used uh, multiple years. Um, we, we trap 
uh, for these across the state with the help of Extension educators. And we publish our trapping updates um, online every week, especially during the heavy of the season. Um, so look out in the corn newsletter for updates on that. And that will give everybody some general timing estimates on when to be scouting for eggs um, and, and uh, in larvae, but more important eggs uh, because of the short spray window you have um, to control caterpillars. Now, really, the a best way to control for, for caterpillars is just the presence of BT. Um, there are BT products that should work well and do work well for all of the three main caterpillar species we have. But we're starting to see some, some uh, issues with the presence of BT. So just a brief history of the common BTs for caterpillars. Some of you remember the old yield guard and, and um, so the old yield guard had a protein called CRY1AB. Now I'm going to talk a little bit about these pr proteins because this is important. Um, each protein is, is um, all of the proteins are different. And because of the high specificity, some proteins work for some pests and not the other one. So it's important to kind of know what proteins you're dealing with. And I'll show a good resource at the end where we can find this information. Well, CRY1AB was the old yield guard. We had CRY1F, which is the old Herculex. We had then CRY1A.105 and CRY2AB2, which is the uh, double pro. Uh, then we have VIP3A, which is Viptera. Um, and now, and, and, you know, 20 years ago, these you can get these in, in just in a single trade. But nowadays, most of these products, if not all of them that are on the market, come in some combination. It's very hard and very difficult to find a corn that has just one trait against um, caterpillar species. Note any cry three, so anything with a three are used for beetles and most likely rootworms. So the cry ones are for caterpillars, cry threes are for rootworms, and VIP, VIP three is for caterpillars. Now, if you're confused, and I know I confused a lot of you, I only I always get confused myself talking about the presence of proteins versus what's in, in what trait. I always recommend looking at the handy BT trait table. This was just updated for February and 20 for updated for the 2023 field season. This was compiled by Chris Founds of Michigan State and Pat Port of Texas A&M posts this on its website. Here's the link here, but if you Google just handy BT trait table, you'll find this. And there's very good information here because it lists the trait packages, which all of you are probably more familiar with. I say cry one IB, and I know this is a webinar, but I can see blank stares at me right now, not understanding where cry one AB is. But if I say Acre Max or AgriSure or Power, PowerCade or, or Duracade or, or Power core all of those are are familiar to you but here we list what proteins are available or what are present in those in those trait packages and here we say which um, traits with lepidopterans they're marketed control for so ecb is, is european corn borer corn earworm here's western bean cutworm and what's interesting is we are listing, the entomologists are listing um, where we've seen evidence for resistant cases for all the BTs in the packet. So, for example, Acre Max that has Cry1AB and Cry1F, we've seen evidence of resistance in Western bean cutworm and corny worm to this. So, this gives you some idea of the presence of resistance. So for Ohio specific, so but th this is not necessarily Ohio specific. So um, on this call, on this webinar, I want to talk a little bit about what is actually going in Ohio, and uh, the important cases we see <clears throat> for Western bean cutworm. We've seen resistance to Cry One F first started around 2014, and and now we don't recommend Cry One F for Western bean cutworm control. We only recommend Vip Three A, which is the, the Viptera for against Western bean cutworm. For corn earworm, we have found resistance to cry 1A.105 and cry 2AB um, um, in uh, in Ohio, and this is consistent to what we uh, other entomologists have seen across the country, especially along the eastern shore. Um, cry 1F and cry 1AB, these traits do not naturally work, so there's not resistance because of the specificity it didn't work against corn, worm, corn earworm anyway. So really, the only thing that works really well for corn earworm is VIP3A, which is Viptera. <clears throat> Interesting case about European corn borer. Um, uh, there has been resistance to Cry1F found in Nova Scotia, Canada in 2018. Um, it it may be spreading to other parts of Canada, which is somewhat worrisome for the Ohio. Um, Viptera, in this case, does not work against European corn borer. So the only other cries 
uh, only the other cries work, which is cry 1A, B, and 1A, and 105, and cry 2. Um, we have not seen any evidence for uh, resistance in European corn borer or 2 cry 1F in Ohio. We have not seen any resistance in, in corn borer to any cry proteins in Ohio. So for as what we know, it's still safe to use and these still should be effective. But if you have any issues, or even if you see the presence of corn borers, let your educator know, let me know, and we'll really take a look because this is something we really want to watch out for. So to manage BT resistance in Ohio, I'm going to go through this quickly in case there's questions. Really think about whether or not you need the traits. Uh, think about rotating the traits. Look at the handy BT trait table. Really provides, get as much information as you can in terms of what traits you have in, in that, that package you're, you're planting. Um, and really be out in your field to make sure that the trait is living up to uh, what you expect. I mean, some of these BT traits are very expensive and they are really good, but we are seeing issues with resistance in, in other areas of the country. So this is a good time. We're in the position now we're recommending to go out there, scout and make sure that what you're paying, you're getting what you're paying for. Also plan some non-BT as a learning process. You know, we, we do some data on the corn performance trials. There's always one or two varieties that have no BT and just on a cursory look of what I've done with some of the data, those are yielding pretty well too, even without um, any incidents of, of pest damage. So again, in terms of which BTs work for Ohio, all the root room traits will work for Ohio. I know that's not the case out in the Western Corn Belt, but as far as I know, we have not seen any evidence of really strong resistance to root room. So all the root room traits work. Your European corn borer, everything that, that's labeled for your European corn borer will work against your European corn borer. Um, and again, VIP does not naturally work. Corn earworm only traits with VIP. And the same goes for Western Mean Cutworm. That's these are the BT, BTs that will continuously work for Ohio. Um, so I'll skip that. And with that, I thank you. And if there's time for questions, I think I have maybe if there are questions, I think I have left a minute or two that I can answer any questions. So thank you.